Hello, my name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, What the DG, sponsored by SAS. I just love saying that title. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or we, if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share the answer questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information throughout the webinar. Joining us today is Kimberly Navala. Kimberly, aka the Governance Guru of the SAS Best Practices team, is responsible for industry education, key client strategies, and market analysis in the areas of business intelligence and analytics, data guidance, and master data management. She is the author of Sustainable Data Governance, the Data Governance eBook, Maps, Mechanics, and Morals, 10 Mistakes to Avoid When Launching a Data Governance Program, and the Analytic Enterprise. We're going to have her with us here today, and with that, I will give the floor to Kimberly to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining me today on what, at least here on the West Coast, is a great and blustery day at best. It seems appropriate because we're going to be talking today about indicators that army weather may be ahead for your data governance program. Today, what I'm going to walk you through today is some of the common pitfalls and barriers that cause data governance programs to falter, fumble, and in some cases, outright fail. And this is really to provide some food for thought as you either begin or continue uh, your data governance journey. The goal today is not necessarily to provide a prescriptive relief necessarily but to really help you diagnose and identify some of these common gotchas before they actually become mission critical within your organization and within your program. And I think it's interesting because to some extent that was a very gloom and doom intro, but uh, a lot of the cases, some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today really happen uh, as programs start to grow and mature and gain traction. So the good news is that your program will grow and mature, and the bad news is there's some growing pains that come along with that. Uh, and unlike the growing pains that some of us experience you know, in our teenage years, um, unless we actually deliberately and actively address some of these issues, they can signal um, a death knell, if you wish, if you wish for, your, for your data governance program, and they can cause data governance to become a bit of a four-level uh, in a lot of organizations. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of peep in the nose at a, a prototypical company who is struggling um, to address uh, and overcome some of these, some of these issues. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a, a of a, so uh, kind of joining the staff, I, I worked for a manager consulting company. And a lot of the work that we did was actually engaging with companies to develop both governance strategies and help develop and define uh, their organizational framework around data governance. And we were working with a uh, very large retailer and in the course of their discovery activities with a number of executives. And in the course of conversation with one particularly vocal, important Executive, he said, he gave us, he kind of went all the reasons why they needed data governance and the objectives and the value. And it was quite clear that he got it. And he said, here's what I need you not to do. Here's what you need to do to me. This is, this is not success to me. And, and he found, what he did is he turned around and picked up something from behind his desk and turned around and, and dropped it on the desk. And what was actually a binder, and a binder that was about three to four inches thick. And the, the title of the binder was the dead, it was the customer data governance binder. And don't do this, don't recreate this binder. And what's really interesting about that is um, what we did, and I call this sort of the academic approach. When we took a look inside this binder, we said that the Creator designer had done a very, very good job of actually thinking through 
conducting all the T's and dotting the I's, right? They have thought of all of the short and long-term objectives for data governance. They have had all of the new goals, uh, processes, and procedures that might be needed in the short, medium, and long term for the program. They have up with some, you know, prototypical workflows, escalation mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. This is all really good work because the only place that that actually was was in the binder. Because, in fact, in very positive intent to try to really account for every possible objection and identify every eventuality, they had really just overcomplicated the process. And it was incredibly overwhelming to the organization at large. Right? So the organization really looked at that binder and ultimately just scratched their heads and said, we don't know what to do with this. Right? We don't want to do this. It looks good on paper, but how do we actually translate that into data governance on practice? Um, a quick I'm going to find the band, so I'm going to just uh, pick up my head. You guys let me know if this is uh, better or not. Is this better? Yeah, a little better. Sorry, Kimberly, you, you were fine okay. leading up, of course. <laughs> okay, so if that goes in and out, this might just be storm, so uh, technology. Um, so. So what we call this, is, and so this is one of the first topics I want to talk about, and it's this idea of the academic approach. Where, uh, and we see this happening in organizations in one of two ways. Either you have folks who really get it, and in fact, they're a little bit actually overzealous. Right? We're excited about bringing this to the organization and all the things that we know that can be done, is that we actually sometimes overwhelm the organization with too much information too fast. Alternatively, we know the organization has some, has some resistance, and we're actually trying to, as I said, account for every possible objective, objective up front. But the problem is that in doing so, we just made it too complicated. We made it overwhelming and uh, somewhat ironically played into some of those objections. So it's very, very important that as we go forward with data governance, that we do develop strategy, that we do design the program but that we're in very deliberate, bite-sized chunks. And we're only actually communicating and developing new processes, putting roles in place just in time, just in time when we actually need those to get the current job at hand done. And P. Moore, I think, said this very well. He's a noted corporate uh, strategist and, and uh, consults with a lot of the, the, the biggest companies in the world. And he said, it is more important for organizations uh, to do, he said, that, or what she recommends is organizations do nothing. He said, better for you to do zero than to do four things badly. Okay, so we need to look at and focus on those areas and develop the roles, the practices, and incorporate these new uh, actions in a stepwise fashion. In a lot of cases, uh, less is more when it comes to data governance. And it's in because if not very deliberate in doing this, we get very anxious. And what people don't understand that they actively resist. And this actually then brings up a secondary issue. That issue is that in the, in, the, uh, in the interest of trying to get people on board the data governance bus, it happens at the council levels, but it depends a lot actually at the data stewardship level in particular, that we have a tendency to make it easy for the organization. And it's also that what we tend to say as we get that resistance, because we don't understand how this works, I'm not sure uh, what I should be doing. What we're saying to them is, hey, don't worry about it. It's easy. I'll take care of it. Right? I'm like, I'll take care of it for you. And we fall in the trap of becoming the doers as opposed to the enablers of the data governance and data management practices in the organization. And this is actually a bit of a problem because what we are doing with good intention at that point is we are relieving our organization of responsibility for data. And we're actually allowing them to not actively engage. Right? Data governance is now, the, now our problem. It's the problem of the New Data Governance Council. It's the problem of the data stewards. And what we know is that if we could have fixed it Right, RLs in the first place, we wouldn't have needed data governance at all. 
so one of the hardest things, and this is particularly true as you move out of that initial phase where you're putting and, and doing some of those proofs of concepts, is operationalizing analytics. It's for us to change our mindset to maybe a more consultative or facilitation-oriented mindset that says the role, for instance, as a data steward, is not to do the day-to-day data management, et cetera. My job is not to be the subject matter of all things data. My job is to actually know who those people are and help them facilitate their work, help them collaborate amongst themselves. So I'm here to actually translate and connect those subject matter, uh, those are experts with the organization, and work with, find those key influencers. So I develop a, a very active and engaged community of practice. And again, it's a very specific mindset. And, and we see this, we see this in a lot of areas, but data stewardship in particular, where subject experts are not always good data stewards, but a data steward may be a good subject matter expert. And the, the critical success factor there tends to be um, their, uh, the individual's ability to actually facilitate and communicate and to drive towards consensus versus how well they know a specific topic or domain with the organization. Okay. So these are two of the, of, of the issues that we see in organizations, right? The sort of academic approach where data governance is an activity on paper and the propensity of some of those early areas to want to do the work on behalf of the organization. But let's take a look down a different hallway now. Okay. And this next one here is what I call, um, what we hear about this is, is that in a lot of cases, it's very easy for organizations to do things like stand up a new, new, rule, new role, like a data storage role, or even to create a data governance council. One of the things that we tend to overlook is not just creating the role and accounting them with some responsibilities, but how we actually imbibing them with the authority to carry out those actions and reach those goals that we're giving. What this starts to look like is that we have account members or data stewards who become a bit of roving linebackers. The conversation starts to look like this. They say, oh, man, what the heck, right? What the D? Here Kimberly comes again. Who is the to the meeting anyway? What is role? What is she supposed to do? These are the things that we're not necessarily doing, again, in a very deliberate way. It's not only saying, hey, here's some new roles with some new responsibilities. Here's authority, and here's how those activities and the activities of these different roles and people actually impact our existing practices. We're not actually building these data stewardship, these data management activities into our business practices, into our software development life cycle. And the extent to which we're not doing that is the to which data governance just becomes um, a matter of if I feel like it, or, hey, I know Kimberly and some kind of help her out type of activity. And this is actually very frustrating for the different council members and data stewards as well because as they're going about their business and trying very, very with good to put their duties, they're really just scratching their heads and asking themselves, how in the DG did I get here? And how am I actually supposed to draw within the organization without the support, without that very discrete mandate and, and function. And again, it's interesting because one of the things that's probably the easiest to do, but it's something that we see organizations don't do a lot, is be very, very deliberate about what your role means. So many data stewardship just because it's it's, it's the us one. What is it that a data steward is actually going to do? What are the decisions that they are allowed to make? What are the sort of hurdles and thresholds of the organization as a whole? When do you engage a data steward? Do you do not? When do you have an issue that a data governance council should look at? Right? And what's the hurdles and thresholds when you as an individual or as a project team can make a decision? for when you need to engage a data steward, or for when they actually need, or you might need to engage executive data governance council 
council or steering committee. So one of the things that we work with organizations a lot is to be very deliberate in defining it, right? what it means, what the role is, how the role intersects with exist practices and processes, including software development life cycle, you know, how projects are prioritized and, and deal, dealt with. Right? When changes, what doesn't, and when do I need to ask? And there are very simple tools that we've used for a long time that are very powerful in doing this. Things like a RACI or RAP chart, RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed, and it's a way of defining who needs to be involved when in a decision, developing workflows that say, if, for instance, we, have, we want to bring in a new data source, right. workflow for that. Data standards exist. Is there a policy for sharing access that applies to the data source? Yes or no? If yes, do the standards exist and do they apply? Yes, continue on your development life cycle. If a policy doesn't exist or the standards, you need them to be changed, now is the point at which I need to, for instance, engage my data stewardship team. And I know this sounds extremely simplistic, but it's surprising how often we're not, not discreet enough about what to do and how to interact with us in the organization. Okay. This is really, really important because the extent to which we are not, in, in really in a nutshell, mandating, right? that's to find that interaction is the extent to which the governance becomes a volunteer activity, right? where we're asking people to engage with us on sort of different projects or different initiatives based on their own personal uh, belief in the topic um, or having extra time at hand. Okay? The extent to which the governance of volunteer, voluntary activity is the extent to which it will not get it done. Because when is the last time you actually had extra time on a project or even extra time in your day job to do something. So if the covenant becomes an as time permits activity, or if it is only as good as the ability of your stewards or your data managers to get other people to help them out, sometimes out of sympathy, right, is then to which you're going to get traction long term. The second note here. Um, we talk a lot about role percentages and functions. To what extent do I need to have data stewards who are focused to the job? What percentage of the time do my data governance council members need to be there? And there's not one necessarily answer for everybody because it does depend on the scope of your program and what people are uh, strong. However, the one we know is that these roles need to be formalized to have discrete performance metrics and measures around them and cannot be sort of the idea of a second day job. It can't be somebody that, something that someone is just sort of already doing so we're going to give them the tag of a data steward or we're going to ask them to be on a data governance council or something that they do at time permits. Okay, the neighborhood SME who does it because they feel the passion and the pain um, is a sometimes a way to start, and those are the folks that help us develop that grassroots movement, but it is not a way for us to, to sustain these activities on an ongoing basis. Okay. So we talked here about being very, very clear about that we give people responsibilities about providing the authority to actually make decisions and take action. To do that accountability is clear and that we actually really define how this impacts existing roles and processes to ensure that data governance, um, both in terms of new roles, but also in terms of participation in these practices and standards, isn't a volunteer effort. Um, and so keep that in mind, and then let's talk about a slightly new as well. One of the things I think that's very, very difficult, and again, we see this a lot with organizations that are just getting started started or as organizational uh, programs start to grow, the idea that we are going to have a set of processes and practices and they are going to apply across all data or the domains and across all of the different processes and practices that we have within the organization. And so it's, it's a bit of an idea that 
we've got this sort of one size fits all process. And the problem with this is that it assumes that everyone that we're dealing with is both equally important and that everyone is equally prepared to engage uh, in the conversation and in the solution. And in fact, we know that that's not true. And I'll, I'll use an analogy. I was recently on a biking trip in Italy, and uh, somehow I had managed to forget that Italy was particularly hilly. I'm also not uh, you know, an experienced cyclist. So when we were on this tour, uh, we had very common goals. We all started at the same place every day, and we all ended at the same place every day. But what was interesting is we actually had four different routes available to us. So those like myself, who were perhaps a little bit unprepared um, for a long route, could take a shorter route. Maybe there were hills, maybe more stops. Maybe I pushed my bike up a, a hill or two uh, that the advanced group didn't need to do. But the idea was that we have a very similar policy or objective, but we have different mechanisms to engage. So one of the things that we need to be really cognizant of is are we developing flexible processes so that the investment and level of effort that we're putting in place actually commensurate with the value of activity or the value of the data that we're dealing with. And a good example here might be, for instance, the idea of data I have that conversation prefers or the idea of data quality in big data. When, when we look at sort of traditional data domains, right, structured data, we have an approach for data quality. And data quality is still important to big and small data. It's important to all data. But now mechanisms might have changed a little bit. So with your data, very often when we're looking at that information, it might be that's internal to the organization. And our approach is to identify those issues and to try to correct that at the source, because we have a little bit of that. The big data, it's a different, because a lot of times we're pulling sources from external places, they're third-party sources, we don't have the ability, particularly with social mediums and so on and so forth, to actually go out and correct that data. So then a find the issue and fix it approach is actually to try to augment the data by providing multiple different sources that all together we can cook and get a complete picture of a person, our business, et cetera, et cetera. This is more sort of an augmentation versus a correct approach. Um, two different approaches to data quality, philosophically at the high level, our objective and outcomes are the same. We're applying a different process in practice. So we need to make sure that, that again, it's, you know, all data quality issues are not equal, all data is not equal, and all usages, all context of use is not always equal. That process that actually take that into account when we're deciding how to activate uh, and operate against that data. And ultimately, right, the right amount of data governance or data management in the organization is the minimum amount required to get it done. Organizations very often pre fall prey to this, again, as the programs are growing, where we take a sort of approach that I call everyone for everything. So as decisions or issues come up, we're pulling together or trying to bring everybody to the table to provide opinions and to help, help rectify different issues and concerns. And because what tends to happen here is either sort of this death by meeting or this sort of committee consensus driven reality. And in a lot of organizations, this means that the data search approves or the data governance council is in a bit of a deadlock. First of all, we have to find the time to get everyone to the table, and then everybody needs to agree. And to agree, what ends up happening is we end up escalating pretty much everything to our executive team. So the idea of issue escalation and exception handling being the standard operating procedure uh, as opposed to an exception-based process. So that now dedicated or get executed on as an executive did. At this point, the executives themselves are looking at each other and say, hey, DG, do I even have this program if I'm still required to make, make all of these level of decisions? And very, they're very operational and tactical decisions that are well below, you know, it's the executive's pay grade. It's, it's below what they're supposed to be doing. So what we're actually seeing organizations do here, okay, both address the issue of what well, doesn't fit all, right? And every problem is not the same size and scope. It may not actually require the same level of activity to fix. 
but looking at working group type mentality to determining who do we need to bring together to solve a particular problem. And working group mentality at the data stewardship level, as well as at our data governance council level. If the issue comes in, they, we will take a look at it and say who is ultimately eligible or needs to be an active part of this decision, and let's bring just those people to the room or into the meeting to discuss the issue. And that comes to an agreement. Then we use the broader forum. Maybe that's the complete data stewardship working team, or it's escalating to the broader data governance council, and the data governance council to the executive team to break that tie. But we ultimately, right, at any point in time, going to be bringing together different subgroups or working groups of people to address a number of different issues. And an area of interest, not an area where you have decision rights, you don't need to actually uh, participate. And so this becomes, helps the program become much more nimble and people are much more inclined to participate because we're not just all coming to a meeting where maybe we're talking about issues that nobody cares about, right? Or they actually don't, don't have um, an influence or a say in, okay? So overall, right, this now becomes much more agile, much more flexible, and we're bringing people to the table as and when needed. Okay. In the sort of everyone for everything mentality. So another consider um, is the fact that patients at large, generally speaking, are adverse to change. And the fact of the matter is, is that with the governance, with the leadership, with more rigorous control over data management, the data management paradigm, we will be challenging existing paradigms. And we'll actually potentially be asking the organization to rethink programs that those senior leaders have previously put into place. And so one of the things that we need to do um, is first be of that, right? Be of the change management incumbent in what we're doing. Um, and be very cost savvy in how we communicate, how and why we're asking in the organization to change. And what I like to say when I talk about cultural change is we're not telling our executives and our business partners that baby is ugly. We're telling them that their baby is growing up and some need to actually start interacting with that baby in a different way. Okay. We're talking about the focus is on why now and what expectations are. So have an adversity to change within the organization at, at, at large, right? We will poss very probably be be challenging some existing operating models, existing roles that have grown up over time. But the thing that we need to be aware of is that we need to make sure that we are future-proofing our data governance program processes as well. So before we sort of had that idea of one size fits all or that sort of everyone for everything mentality, is we need to actually understand up front that our data governance processes will change over time. Okay. I often talk to organizations and I say, if I come back in a year, so I do executive health checks, and the same people are sitting on your data governance council, we've done something wrong. Because either your business has not changed at all, or the data governance council hasn't changed to match where the business is currently at. So we will expect that our processes and the participation in council and processes will change. The is to less a subject change, but the who and the what and the why will change over time. So as leaders of data governance, we actually have to make sure that we're setting expectations that we know that we might actually get it wrong. We know we are going to come out in proof, like do a proof of concept or a prototype for a process, and we are going to adjust. We're going to adjust to make sure that it's optimal for the organization. And then we're going to put in place practices. So maybe it's a yearly review. Or you have new strategies that are delivered. Continuously assess whether we have the right processes and the right people in place for the organization as it exists today. Okay. So again, two perspectives here with the adversity to change. Understand that if you're at the forefront of data governance in your organization, even as much as we all agree that data is an asset, et cetera, et cetera, we need to agree to that, that to the extent it doesn't require us personally to change, right? We believe everyone else should change. 
but we also need to make sure that we are actually addressing that issue within our program itself. I'm here, and, and you know, story. So I was recently at a data governance console, and I was talking to um, a fellow in a financial, very large global financial services institution, asking them about their program and, and how was it running. And he said, you know what, Kimberly, it's great. It's fantastic. He said, all, all these, you know, we've gotten these new tools around data management, and we have a process for data quality. And so, you know, people are coming in and they're asking questions. And I said, that's fantastic. So how do you decide what you what you want? Or how do you decide what you need to go work with? And he said, well, really, we're not formal. He said, it's, it's really just about, you know, I focus on the projects with people that I really know and who know me and are willing to work with me, right? So, in fact, there's a bit of a self-limitation here because the method works very good when we're developing the program initially and finding some of those early adopters. But this isn't a mechanism that can scale across the organization uh, in a large way. Okay. Um, and when you're dependent on interpersonal relationships only, is that we're creating this sort of personality and relationship-led culture. Dance is only as good as who you know, and it is only as good as long as those people remain in the organization and in the position that they have. Okay. So use tribal knowledge. It has a place. We use tribal knowledge to actually generate buzz. We use it to create some communities of interest. Right in the process, but it cannot be the basis of learning and ongoing engagement. Okay. To actually figure out how do we actually create these roles and set these activities as that into things like software development lifecycle, in the process of developing business strategy, in project prioritization, to ensure that data governance becomes business as usual. Um, and yes, there is a place for our ability to influence and engage the organization at large. So this idea of interpersonal relationships will always come into play, but the execution itself can't be based only on that. So um, when we talk about the idea of data governance execution, one of the other things that we see very often is that when we go and talk to organizations, we'll talk to them about what the data governance program, right, any level, whether it's the executive council or the governance council or the data stewards or the management teams are working on, and often what they will tell us is, hey, we have this sort of laundry list. We have a whole number of projects that we started last year, that we started this year. We're starting to look at in projects for next year, and a lot of projects got to a certain point and never sort of went any farther. And it's actually interesting because one of the things as the organization comes to the table around data is that there's going to be no dearth of problems in your organization. Okay, you will not have a problem finding data issues to repair or address or that need to be looked at. The issue is how do we actually turn those issues into executable projects and programs? Not only just do some assessment, but actually result in impact moving the needle within the business. And two issues to be addressed here. Number one, is as we're looking at initiatives for data governance, data stewardship, data management, to what extent are those initiatives embedded in or an integral part of other business or soft development projects? The indicators that we see is to the extent data governance or data management projects are not discrete efforts that are baked in to other ongoing business projects is a really critical indicator of where they will A, get done, and B, their long-term success will be in being to start change, changing the needle and, and changing how the business as a whole operates. So one, when we're thinking of how how do we execute and what projects should we engage on, the best place to start is by looking at our business strategy, by looking at those project plans and initiatives for, for an annual basis, for instance, and figure out how do we actually support, promote, and integrate within those, those projects. Number one best way to execute. The number two thing we have to look at, though, is that in some cases there may actually be projects that really are 
rolled up in our data governance projects themselves, maybe to do with the development of a new access and use and sharing policy. That's going to apply across multiple business units, multiple processes. It doesn't, it's not something that necessarily can be done in the context of one discrete project or program. And as I those, we need to be considering two things. The first is identify these projects, how to get those into the pipeline, into the standard project prioritization and resource allocation pipeline. So our sanctioned funded project. What's the intersection point? Do that. And the second is understanding that very often these types of projects, for instance, I need to actually reevaluate our privacy and usage policies. Right, we still a lot now with, with data, with social media, et cetera, et cetera. We need to rethink our approach to data privacy and usage and access. So there's an interesting thing that happens here is there's there's two components. One, we need to create and get the new policy or new data standards and data rules. And we actually need to implement those policies and standards and rules. And often, organizations try to address those as one sort of discrete project stream. And what will happen is we may get down the path. We may actually create the policy, and then the process stops because we don't have a clear plan for how we take that policy to market or how do we actually execute that in the course of, of, of daily business. And what will happen is, is it's something like the data governance chicken and egg. Right? We don't have new policies and standards because that our systems and processes aren't going to be compliant with them. But our systems and processes aren't compliant or aren't adopting those new policies and standards. We have sanctioned policies and standards. And now what we see here is this idea that we need to actually sort of achieve perfect compliance, achieve perfection in terms of the implementation of new policies and standards on day one. So organizations that have done a really good job, and they've made some pretty fundamental changes in how their organization and, you know, sizes around certain types of data or has changed their privacy and access policy, actually doing that in a tangible, tactical way. Take a two-step two approach. Number one, we find the need for new policies or data standards and data rules and on what those are going to be. And as part of that initial project, the last step is actually to develop what go-to-market or what the project execution plan will be. And to take that project execution plan, which includes a phased rollout, including when will different systems and processes be asked to be compliant, implement this, to get uh, support and funding for that execution piece. And because if we do it that way, we can do something what I call creeping compliance. So we come up with new data rules, new data standards, new tools, new ways. As new projects come up, we're going to ask them to actually adopt those things from the get-go. As systems and processes are actually being maintained or upgraded, we also ask them to then now make the changes to adopt maybe those policy standards or rules. And we start to get creeping compliance from the top, from a down and a bottom-up approach within the organization. And it allows us to make very deliberate decisions about how, when, and where new policies and rules will be implemented so to manage the pace of that change so that the organization can actually consume it. Okay. And this is very, very, very important because it is very easy to come up with new standards. It's, new, easy, to, it's easy to come up with new policies. It's even you come up with better rules. It's not easy to then get those rules, uh, policies, and standards implemented in practice within your organization. And find is the extent to which organizations take an incremental approach to that execution and implementation, to the extent to the extent that they're focusing on incremental improvements and not overnight perfection, is the extent to which these types of programs are successful or not. And then, you know, but not least, um, and those of you who have talked with me before, seen me present, um, I, I will admit up front to everyone else that this is my own personal soapbox, and it is that ultimately. Data stewardship, data management is not about the data, which seems particularly a statement that data governance is not about the data. Ultimately, it really isn't because what we're trying to do here 
is to improve our data and to drive the business. So one of the things that we see happen very often, for instance, is we might be focusing on and looking at and reporting back to our executives and business leaders on how good or how much better our data quality has gotten in, in an area. And all guys, they don't care. Why do they not care? Because we haven't actually drawn the line between improvement in data and improvement in the business itself. So one of the things that we need to actually be very, very careful about, right, and this it overlays into both how do we prioritize projects, but also how we actually um, support out success. Right? How do, what is success and how do we communicate that? We need to make sure we're, we're tying anything that we do to what matters to the business and that we really laser focus our efforts on those elements that help move the needle. Because I said, there are a load of data issues in the organization. And they may be very painful to a large number of folks. But setting all of those issues, right, there's a very discrete few. I call it the 1%, right, senior 1%. 1% of those issues um, will actually fundamentally move the needle for the business, right? They will fundamentally help us improve decision making. They will help us improve the overall efficiency of the business or it's more effective and help us lower risk. So when we're identifying where our focus areas and what our priorities are, it's very, very important that we start to provide that, that lens and that we also report out those results in that context. I'll use an example because it's, it's probably an obvious one. It's an easy one of financial services where not a lot of, for obvious reasons, work on the idea of uh, compliance, right? things like solvency. Interesting because as part of some of these new regulations, we're being asked to report on the quality, the completeness and accuracy of the data that went into, for instance, calculating our equity risk in different areas. And really that the regulators fundamentally care about how good or bad your data is. What they're actually trying to see is good or bad your data is, is an indicator of how good or bad your business decision making was from a risk. Because you're making a decision on a risk number better better or worse. So one of the financial institutions have now started doing is now I report out my risk number. Maybe it's I admit it there's a whole whole list of issues. But I also now report out what my confidence is in terms of data quality. Right? Do you have certified data going into this decision? Maybe it's inaccurate. Maybe it's 5 percent accurate. But based on that, what I can say is I, I think I have a spread risk of this amount, maybe it's just a billion, right? but 20 percent swag in that number because the data is 20 percent. We can't certify. We're sure of how accurate or correct it is. Even just knowing that helps us suddenly change the decision we make, for instance, of how much cash I keep on reserve. Right? I make a different decision on that $2 billion number if I know that I've got it. 20 plus or 20 percent confidence in it. Than if I thought it was 100 percent confident, what we're actually doing is tying data quality in this case to a business metric that actually has a fundamental impact that drives the bottom line. Aid now that connection between improved data with a business outcome, and we can now make really smart decisions about when do we go in and start providing, for instance, projects to better correct or manage that information based on how better how information will, will influence our business decision making. Okay, for example, but I think a very good one and a very strong tie-in between improvements in data and an improvement in business decision making and risk management. So ultimately, when we're talking about data governance, when you're talking about your activities as a data steward, when you're talking about your activities as a data manager, we should be talking about this in the context of, hey, I'm improving data, or hey, I have a lot of data issues. I need to be talking about these things in terms of business impact. So this, of course, um, you know, is, is hard to do. And, and these are issues, as I said, that we see with their heads repeatedly for organizations. So a quick checklist, and this will be um, available to you as well as part of the PDF post to this, for you guys to think about in helping your organization avoid the G word, right? What's the DG? One is we have to plan for the plan. So we have to really have a deliberate approach 
and focus around what we work on and what we don't and how those new roles and processes will be will be brought to bear. We also want to take an approach of piloting roles and processes and being very clear and transparent with the organization that, hey, we know we need to do this. We think that's the right way, but we're going to actually we're going to try it out in a very small focused area and some of our learnings will adjust the process and then we'll roll it out more broadly. So this is a sort of pilot proof of concept mode, test out, work out the kinks in these new processes and roles, and then we'll create a blueprint that helps us roll out to the organization at large, right, pre-clients. It also addresses up front and sets an expectation of change over the long term. You need to avoid that idea of second day jobs where people are just going to do it because it's a part of their job or they're already sort of interested in it. Because the extent to which data ship or data governance or data management is your second job is the extent to which that work does not get done. I'll make sure that we're right sizing decision making. So we're not creating processes that are too custom or too overbearing. And we want to make sure that the hurdles and thresholds for decision making with the processes makes relative to the size and scope of the issue that we're dealing with. Okay. One of the ways that we do that, because ultimately the best data governance is the most governance that there is. So right, the government, we only want as much data governance as is needed to get the job done. We also want to push data governance and decisions as close to the operational level, right, where these are coming up as possible. We need to embed these activities and decision points into our existing processes. We need to enforce that operational authority. If we're going to tell people that they now have the ability to make these decisions, we need to support them in that, and we need to ensure that that, that process of escalation of issues doesn't become the de facto get jail free card. It's the perennial right. If mom says no, I'll ask dad. To the extent happens, this is the extent to which we're undermining our own processes and practices. Um, and we have to practice this idea of positive promotion. And again. One of the keys here is that the way that we do that is by focusing on improvement, measuring ourselves on incremental improvement and not perfection over, over the long term. And we need to actually measure business outcomes. Ultimately, no one really cares necessarily about the integrity of the data if you can't align that to help a lack of integrity or a lack of quality. A lack of availability or access is eating the day-to-day uh, -day jobs and business at large. Okay. And the last point here is that ultimately to the point, your business strategy should be driving your data governance strategy. So the best way to develop your data governance roadmap is to look at your business strategies, which drive different initiatives and projects, and then ask the question, what information include new data, new capabilities or new tools are required to support the initiative? and develop a roadmap based on that. It goes to, for instance, let's go out and, and survey the data in the organization and determine which is the dirtiest. So the dirtiest data may have the greatest value to the organization and vice versa. So with that, Adam, and uh, back to Shannon for some questions. Thank you so much. I'm already getting a lot of emails and comments about what a great presentation this has been. Thank you for that. Um, and just, you know, let me first answer the most popular question that happens in all of the webinars and just let everybody know and reminder that I'll be sending out a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Thursday, with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session so you have all of that information and we've already got a couple of great questions coming in um this question kimberly you know i think you could probably turn into a full webinar in of itself <laughs> but uh, let me just kind of throw this your way um since you're covering some very important points just a few more things i'd like to hear from you one what are um going to be the trends of dg in near and far future and two which areas organizations are finding it difficult to perform because of lack of products and tools, et cetera? Yeah, both, both very good questions. You know, it's, it's actually interesting because one of the things I think that um, there's a couple of comments in, 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 in that says, hey, this is, what we actually realize is that this is really, really hard. 
And the truth is, this is really, really hard. Um, and an interesting down here um, in terms of developing agile and responsive processes and balancing the organization's appetite for new roles, and to some extent, what's seen as bureaucratic process. And one of, I think, probably the most important trends. Now, whether this actually, you know, 20 years or 15 years, is that still there, is we're starting to see this instantiation, and I'm sure you all heard of it, of, of this thing called the data officer. And in that organizations actually are instantiating chief data officers now, is that they're realizing that this actually takes a deliberate and sustained approach um, to actually managing the change within the organization, to changing our thinking, to putting new processes and people in place. And to make that happen in a lot of cases, we actually have to have a dedicated um, voice and a dedicated force for managing that program from the top down. So I think it's actually a very interesting harbinger of things to come um, because the extent to which we now see a chief data officer is the extent to which organizations are now not just talking of data as I said conceptually, but we're starting to put some resources and, and need behind uh, actually developing that. And of course, the, the backward trend that drives that is the digitalization of the business, where you're looking at social and mobile, or even just the idea of data monetization, where we're becoming more and more aware that the value in the organization very often is information in the data we have, more than necessarily, um, and using that to drive products and services, more than you know, the data being necessarily in, in, in the product or service itself. Um, so I think that's actually going to be interesting. And one of the things I find interesting on the bureaucracy question is that, you know, if you look back 10 years to the idea of when, like, SOX, are, SOX for instance, came into uh, key practitioner, when you looked at organizations, so this is organizations like financial services where we have very, very um, rigorous processes for how we actually account for, you know, in, in um, reporting and so on and so forth. When Carbon uh, SOX came into place, every SOX project, was a project in and of itself. Never, uh, you know, whether an application that was being developed or changed or a business process being created that SOX applied, there was a sort of separate work stream for SOX in the organization. Today, activities that deal with SOX clients, they're actually built into, right, those activities and processes and decision points are built into the business uh, process development and software development life cycles. We don't necessarily have separate projects anymore. So the hope is that with the creation of the CDO and this whole new focus on in the digital economy on data sort of being that key enabler for participating there, um, and the increased focus around this and creating those roles and processes, that in 10 and 15 years, we won't be talking about data governance as a discrete and separate thing. It will just be part of business as usual. Um, whether that comes to fruition or not is, you know, a, a question. But ultimately, I think it's going to follow a similar traje trajectory as we saw with things like, uh, so, you know, Starbucks, Oxley. Um, most organizations are still at a very early stage of that, um, but we will we will see. And then I think the second part of that question, you said which areas or organizations are finding it difficult to perform because of products and tools, and. It's just in smaller organizations, and, and I would say that in a lot of the larger organizations, it's not necessarily a lack of products and tools, except for maybe around decision flow and workflow type tools that don't tend to be there in the organization. Um, organizations have the flip side, um, which is we have you know, everything in terms of products and tools, sort of not just standardizing our processes and you know coming up with the rules and standards. The creation is the question of, do we need to standardize on products and tools, and which are those right? Which are the right products and tools? So, um, you know that, that's true for data quality, data integration, math data management. And, and what's sort of interesting to me is our approach to master data management, our approach to data integration, right? Which in a lot of cases used to be much more about getting that into a centralized warehouse and then pulling it out and so on and so forth, are also changing radically. But I would probably, maybe controversially, argue that organizations. Um, I'll find themselves more stymied because of the profusion of connected and disparate products than because of a fundamental lack of products outside of some of maybe that business process management and decision management type workflow tools.
I'm going to answer that in, in, in very as short as possible. <laughs> like I said, you could probably do a whole webinar on those topics. <laughs> this is perfect. Yeah. Um, the next uh, question is, could you explain the second big jobs point again and how that ties into assigning data stewards without hiring more people and getting people to turn more responsibility in addition to their regular duties? Yeah, so one of the, the idea of the second day job is um, is the idea that, well, in a lot of cases, right, we see this within, um, you know, application teams where we're already integrating data. We see this within our BI, our traditional BI analytics teams, where um, people are already maybe sort of doing the work of a data steward, um, but doing that in an informal way because we fundamentally see the need and we're doing that. But those folks are doing that in a, a an, it, 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 informal thing. And so it's sort of that idea that um, we do actually need to develop room space for people to do that formally. And in some cases, what's actually interesting um, is that we don't see a lot of necessarily net new headcount um, in terms of people hiring into roles. But we do see people hiring lead data stewards and, and developing program management offices um, around data governance. So there's maybe two headcount there around program management change management, and then you lead data store, bring some external experience resources. But what I find is it's actually about formalizing the role and creating some metrics and measurement so that you're building time to people get into their standard eight hours for them to do some of this work. Um, in some cases for certain organizations, that's really just about formalizing things that people were anyway, often just right in self-defense. Um, because they had to do it to, to get their job done or to, you know, make things easier for themselves. Um, what we see that it actually does mean that we have to sort of develop some headspace, and it means that we have to reallocate other types of data as well. It's interesting because we see an inordinate amount of time. Actually, there's there's some interesting case around this where we look at, an application development project, and studies have shown that probably up to 20 or 30 percent of the time on any standard project has to do with, um, you know, just logging data, right, trying to find it, trying to integrate it, trying to argue about what's right or not, and all those sorts of things. So there's an incredible amount of time and cost being generated, and it's all under the covers right now. So of what we have to work with in the organizations is help to make that case of here's the activities that you're not seeing, right, and, and you know, bounce that against. Um, potentially the cost of of, of an increased headcount, but, but increased you know time for uh, addressing some of these activities. Um, that being said, initially the best way to make that case is to start finding some projects, um, and people work on those projects. Not maybe necessarily with a formal data stewardship role, but then as we create new policies or we come up with new standards and rules and, and new practices for the tools, then we can make the case project for formalizing that role and time to maintain that momentum and maintain the benefits. Um, so it's a little bit of a let's, let's prove it, prove that it works, and prove that if we spend some time on these things, right, we get there's a benefit or, or a bump. Maybe it's increased project efficiency and effectiveness. Um, you know, maybe it's just an improved data and decision-making coming out of that process and make the case. But really, uh, the answer is not the same for everybody, and it's it's probably one of the hardest things that we deal with. Um, because there is a very real cost to our poor data management and data stewardship organizations that are, they often it's, are, it's just buried um, into the day-to-day -day project work that we're doing. We have time for just one last quick question here for you, Kimberly. In its studies to help sell uh, and sellers and quotes quantify the benefits of Good DG or show the cost of, quote, again quotes cost of poor unquote quality. You know, there's probably um, there's probably quite a quite a list of those, um, and some of them probably depend on your organization. Now, I will say that I, I probably can't pull them off the top of my head, but there's a couple of, of resources. I think Data Diversity is a very good place to look for those. Um, Gartner has some very interesting, and Gartner and Forrester have some interesting um, like targeted reports around uh, quantifying that. Uh, the although it's not sort of an active um, the uh, the DGO um, actually does a lot of web it's the governance professionals organization they sponsor a lot of webinars and have a lot of case studies um, available through that site that speak um, to that point and actually show not only 
how people approach it, but what the specific value proposition was um, explicitly. So those might be some of the um, or areas I might uh, encourage people to look at. And then feel free, if you'd like more information on that, to, um, to ping me after, and I can provide you a list of some resources. Thank you. Kimberly, if you want to send me some um, ideas as well, I can include that in a follow-up email that goes out to everybody a Thursday. And again, thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to all of our attendees for continuing to be so engaged. I know some of you are having a tough time hearing, and I apologize for that, but the sound, oh, it, no, it just, it's sometimes such a time it goes, especially on the on the internet connections, but um, you actually came through pretty clear uh, on the telecom line, so which is where the recording comes from. So if you missed a couple of words and things um, uh, when listening to your internet connection. Uh, you can you get the link to the recording out to everybody again by the end of day Thursday, along with the slides. Uh, and, and thank you so much for hang, everybody hanging in there. And and to thank you so much for uh, again for this presentation and taking the time to to uh, share your, your wisdom with us. And appreciate everyone for joining us and uh, sticking with us. I'm um, certainly interested in, um, as we said, if it was easy, we'd all be doing it. Um, Richard, Richard Ordwich, uh, you were providing some great feedback and, and, and uh, comments as well. And so, um, you know, do feel free to, I'd love to continue the discussion as and if folks are interested. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day.